So now we've got the structure of the membrane down. Now we've got to talk about the, um, the function, how it works. So all of that chemistry that we just talked about comes into play with transporting molecules across the membrane using diffusion, osmosis, or active transport. Selective permeability um, is a critical role played by the plasma membrane. It allows certain things into the cell, but not others. Um, it's sort of like your, your relationships, I assume. You want some things to come in. You want some people in your life. You don't want other people in your life. Especially true now in like social media. You're like, oh, block, block, block. Um, I, if, if you haven't done that yet, it's totally good. Um, you don't have to see whatever these other people say. It's great. Um, so you want to allow some things in, but not others. Because if you allow too much in, you're going to get toxified. You're going to get a lot of uh, bad material in. If you're going to let too much out, you're going to end up releasing your nutrients. And you don't want to do that. So the cell membrane prevents things from getting, uh, on, prevents uh, nutrients and substances from getting out that you don't want out and uh, prevents them from getting in that you don't want in. There's a few ways across with diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. The key to this whole thing is that hydrophobic center of the phospholipid bilayer. We've got a hydrophilic head, a hydrophobic layer in the center, and then a hydrophilic layer. It's sort of like uh, Tootsie Pops. If you look at a Tootsie Pop, you've got this candy outside, a uh, hard candy outside, and this chewy candy on the, in the inside. They have completely different properties. Whereas it's easy to bite down on the center part, it's harder to bite down on the exterior part. So I've noticed, and maybe I'm wrong, a lot of people may like the outside part, or they like the inside part, but the two may not go well together. Oh, you know what else it's like? Uh, what are those things? So blow pops. You have a blow pop and you're like, I would like some gum. Well, you can't have it. It's trapped inside of that, that, that candy. Well, I just want the candy. Well, I don't want gum. So. You've got two totally different layers going on, each with distinct properties. And uh, molecules interact with both distinct. Some molecules are highly permeable. They go right through. They go right through the membrane as if it didn't exist. Uh, gases and small uncharged particles can fit between the different um, phospholipids. They're small enough to slide through. It's almost like, um, oh, I was, at, I was at an amusement park with my son, and he's small, and I'm bigger than him. Surprise. So he was able to negotiate his way between the crowd and get far, far away from me. I couldn't. I was stopped by the, the larger particles, the larger people. Small things can get through places that other things can't. In this case, gases do. I'm not sure how much you know about the circulatory system. So I'm going to give you a super brief, here's everything I know about anatomy, because I really don't know much. Uh, anatomy is not my thing. Um, you breathe in oxygen, right? It comes from out here in your lungs. And there's all sorts of ways it gets there. It could go through your nose. But if your nose is stuffed, it goes through your mouth. You can get it there all sorts of ways. Oxygen goes down to your lungs. In your lungs, you've got uh, blood vessels down there that are really close to the surface so that oxygen can go from high concentration in the lungs into the blood cells. So it sort of like sidesteps in. And then the blood cells carry that oxygen. Now the only reason they were able to move is because there was a low concentration of oxygen in the cells, high concentration in the lungs, and it moved over. And then as those blood cells start moving through your body, because you've got this part and your heart pumps things, they're sort of leaving uh, that oxygen behind, almost like a, um, oh, like, like, <sighs> if you've ever cooked pasta, you've cooked pasta, yeah, good. All right, you take pasta. It's in a pot. In that pot is pasta and water. You take it over to a strainer. Where's the strainer located? That's the best answer. Not always the one I go with for some stupid reason, but it works. You take it to the sink. You pour the bowl into the, into the strainer, and you lift it up. What's coming out of that strainer? Water. Now you got to get the um, pasta from the strainer to the bowl that you want to put the pasta in. 
Where's that pasta bowl? Hopefully, right next to the sink, right? Sometimes, if you don't plan well, it's like in the cupboard or it's all the way across the room. So you take this thing of pasta with the strainer that's leaking all of this water. You go across the room and you dump it into the um, bowl. You have now left behind a trail of water. Does that make sense? Not if you're trying to catch the boiling water. Um, that water dripping out is exactly what would happen from the strainer is exactly what would happen to the red blood cells. Oxygen's constantly streaming out of them, going to the cells around it until they finally get to their destination where they slow down a bit. And we'll get into that in like 102. We'll talk about capillaries and we'll talk about um, uh, webbing and how everything slows down. But once it slows down, the oxygen finishes diffusing. It goes to the area of low concentration in the other cells. And it picks up while it's down there carbon dioxide, which then goes back to the lungs. You get these blood cells back up to the lungs, and they push this carbon dioxide from inside of them, where you have a lot of carbon dioxide, to the lungs, where there's a little bit. And it proceeds right across that membrane as if there was no membrane there at all. Super highly permeable. Gases and small uncharged molecules. It goes right across. It, you, it's like the membrane doesn't exist. Water's pretty darn per permeable. Water's got, there's um, a bunch of proteins in the membrane called aquaporins. And what aquaporins do is they are just big enough to allow water molecules through. Not to allow bigger molecules through, just water. They're selective in that way. And when they, they uh, they're actually, they've got a hydrophilic region that sucks them in, almost like a little water vacuum. Um, they can pull billions of water molecules across a second. So it's as if this uh, membrane was totally permeable to water. Water's just constantly flowing in, and it's constantly flowing out. So only, water. only water. And then you get more molecules. They get bigger. They get less permeable. Polar molecules, sugars, they're easily dissolved. They can get in sometimes. They can fit through channel proteins, but they're getting, uh, it's getting harder and harder to get in for them. Why? Because they're a little bit too large to fit, or um, they may, when they hit the phospholipid bilayer, they're interacting with that hydrophobic layer, and it's excluding them. It's pushing them out. Oh, definitely. Not all molecules are the same size, without a doubt. And these molecules, amino acids, proteins, nucleic acids, polysaccharides, most of our macromolecules, they're too big. They won't fit. So they can't make it through that membrane at all. So you have gases, small and charged molecules, and water that can very easily cross that barrier. Just about everything else needs help. They could make it through, but they need help. And we're going to talk about what helps them through. Before we get there, we're going to talk about small molecules moving along what's called their concentration gradient. A gradient is where you have a high concentration in one area and a low concentration in another. Solutes will always move from a high concentration to a low concentration automatically. No energy required always happening until they're evenly spread out. That process is called diffusion. Um, if you guys ever, yeah, you've had to have, if you've made Kool-Aid or you've made some sort of instant um, iced tea mix, you put the iced tea in the container or the Kool-Aid in the container, it sinks to the bottom. That is a high concentration at the bottom. You wait for a day or two days because you don't want to stir it on your own because that requires energy. Over time, those molecules evenly distribute themselves throughout the entire solution. Thing is, if you were to put a, a membrane right in the middle, that's where it mucks things up. Before I go on, you guys do remember what a solute is, right? Talk about, sorry. You're like, yes, move on. Um, a solute is a particle that's been mixed with a solvent to create a solution. If I was to take salt, and then put it into water, I get a salt water solution. The solute would be the salt. So we're really talking about solute concentrations. Ooh, and what unit of measurement did we have to measure solute concentration? 
Moles. That's why we learn moles. But the thing is, it's not just the amount of solute that's present, it could be the charge. You'll notice here we've got an equal number of solute on either side. But on one side, we have more positive charges, on one side, we have more negative charges. When you have difference in charges on either side of the membrane, you've created what's called an electrochemical gradient. So you have charges on this side that are positive, charges on that side that are negative. They want to even out. So what you end up having with an electrochemical gradient is um, a need to move molecules from one point to another to even the whole thing out. These positives need to come over here. Those negatives need to move over there. That creates a flow. And in biological systems, we can use that flow to create energy. This is ultimately the basis of cellular respiration. Right. If one side of the barrier has a lot of positive charge molecules and one side has a lot of negative charge molecules, they want to shift sides so it's equal. And you can use the energy of that movement to power your biological reactions. These gradients can also move water across a barrier because it's really hard to move solutes across a barrier. We just went through everything that can't get across the membrane. Water can, though. So in order to balance out solute concentrations, to reach that equilibrium, water can move from one side to the other. So over here, we have hypertonic oh, Sorry, words you don't know yet. Uh, we have lots of solute. Yes? Uh, sorry. No, please. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, that's exactly when it occurs when there's a net positive charge on one side and not the other for an electrochemical gradient. So here, we can use gradients to move water. Here's our um, semi-permeable membrane. It'll let some things through, but not others. It'll let water through, for instance. On this side, you'll notice there's some molecules that are just too big. They still want to have roughly the same molarity. So what will happen is the water will rush from the side with less solutes to the side with more solutes. membrane. We can describe these um, solutions in different ways. If we have two solutions that have equal amounts of molarity, equal amounts of solutes uh, per unit volume, they would be termed isotonic. Iso means same. Isotonic. Um, isosceles triangles all have the same angles. Um, isotope. Isomer. So iso, we have the same solute concentrations. Hypotonic, hypo means small, a hypodermic needle. Um, hypoglycemic. You have less solute in solution than you have in the cell. Right, so hypo is small, less solute. If you're um, less solute in solution than in the cell is hypotonic. Smaller amount of solute. And then we have hypertonic. What does hyper mean? Lots. If you're hyperactive, lots of energy. In this case, there's lots of solute outside the cell, not so much inside the cell. So hypertonic. Lots of solute in solution, not so much solute comparatively in the cell. So it could be isotonic, two solutions could be isotonic to each other. One could be hypotonic to the other, which is hypertonic. Water will always move from hypotonic to hypertonic. That's a statement you're just going to have to remember, and it will solve a lot of your problems. Water moves from hypotonic to hypertonic. Because we can't really move solutes that well. There's a membrane in the way. 
Here we have a hypertonic solution. Here we have a hypotonic solution. Water is going to move from this hypotonic solution into the hypertonic solution. And it will actually shift these um, areas. There's a membrane separating them. Always hypo to hyper. Water moves hypo to hyper. That water part's important. Yes, Olivia. You said water moves from hypotonic to Water will always move from hypotonic to hypertonic. Water moves from an area of low solute concentration to high solute concentration. That movement of water is called osmosis. It balances out solute concentration. Osmosis Jones. Yeah, it had nothing to do with osmosis. I watched it just to find out about osmosis. Didn't work. Osmosis is a type of transport that's termed passive because it requires absolutely no energy. There's active transport that requires energy. This is called passive. So here's an example. Water is moving from the solution into the cell. So how would you classify the solution? Hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic? Hypo, hypo because water moves from hypo to hyper. Here, what would you classify the solution? Water's moving out of the cell into the solution. Hypertonic. Water always moves from hypo to hyper. And then this one, water's moving evenly in both directions. So it's isotonic. What does to give you one that had, I don't know, two molar on the outside, one molar on the inside? Which way would the water go, out or in? Two molar on the outside. One molar on the inside, which means there's a lot of solute on the outside. So the water will flow. Um, yeah, the water is going to flow toward the hyper, uh, yeah, the hypertonic solution, the one with the more solute. That's stupid. <laughs> Sorry. In animal cells, animal cells do not have a cell wall. So there are two consequences of putting cells into solutions that are not isotonic. Animal cells do not do well outside of isotonic solutions. You might have osmotic lysing, or you might have crenation or crenelation. Both are the same. With osmotic lysing, water uh, will move from a hypotonic solution into a hypertonic solution. If you were to take uh, pure water and surround cells with it, the water would flood into the cells, causing them to eventually pop. Um, sort of like water balloons. When you guys, I assume you've thrown water balloons at people, um, with or without their knowledge, that's cool. Uh, do you fill them up at the sink, or do you fill them up at the hose? The hose? OK. If you've got a little funnel, there you go. So you take these water balloons, you fill them up at the hose. First type of water balloon you fill up, you only fill it up part way, you tie it off and throw it at somebody, it bounces off them. And then you've lost the element of surprise. Second type of water balloon is the perfect water balloon. It's filled up just right. You throw it at them, on impact, it's, it explodes. The third type of water balloon, though, is the one we've all experienced, which is osmotic lysing. You fill it up, and you, you, keep, you think this is going to be the best one ever. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger until what happens? It pops. Because the structure of the outside cannot contain the water on the inside. Water always moves from hypo to hyper. So if you have a hypotonic solution outside and a hypertonic solution on the inside, water floods in. Yes. So water is going to move from a hypotonic solution to a hypertonic solution. Outside of this red blood cell is a hypotonic solution. Water will flood into the red blood cell. It will fill up like a balloon, and it will eventually pop. Is it just like a hypertonic and a hypotonic? 
hyper is on the inside. Okay. Hypo is on the inside. Sorry, they, they sound very similar. I'm sorry about that. I'll try to enunciate better. For uh, crenation, in this case, you've got a hypertonic solution on the outside and a hypotonic solution on the inside. So which way does the water flow? Out. Out. In this case, the cell shrivels up. Yes? Water diffuses evenly. The problem is these membranes are going to stop these solutes from getting out. So water is going to diffuse in order to make it all even. So, so it's about the solutes, okay. this is about which way the water is moving because of the solutes. Yes? OK, I'll wait. OK. okay. Um, you will know based on the molarity. The higher molarity is going to have more solutes, and so, and which means it's going to be hypertonic, the one with the highest molarity. And you said just to give you a second, you meant the hypertonic solutions on the outside. Right, so hypertonic's on the outside, so water leaves the cells. And that's what makes it shrivel. And that's what shrivels it up. Okay. Yes? The highest molarity is the hyper. Okay. Hyper. Uh, uh, I give you, I'll either give you mol uh, numbers that say this is two molar solution, this is a one molar solution, which way is the water moving? Okay, so that would be two to one? That would be, uh, actually, it'd go from one to two. Which way is the water moving? So, so one molar solution would be oh, hypotonic, okay, yeah. Solution. Always remember, hypo to hyper for water. Questions? Um, okay, the way you can think about this, uh, slugs. If you were to take a slug and drop it in a bucket of water, water will flood into the slug and the slug will blow up like a little sphere of a slug. Go and try it if you want. Um, so water floods in. That slug is acting like a cell. What happens if you put salt on a cell? You create a hypertonic solution around the slug. It dries out. It shrivels up. I assume you've done that. I mean, maybe you're not a horrible person. That's cool. Whatever. I do it to protect my jack-o'-lanterns. Take a ring of salt, put it around my jack-o'-lantern, it stops all the slugs from eating it. What, a ring of salt around it? Oh, good point. Always thinking. Yep. Now, plant cells have, different imp uh, have a different reaction because plant cells have a cell wall. And that cell wall is made of cellulose. It's made of interlinked carbohydrates that make it really, really rigid. So if you were to take a plant cell and put it in a hypotonic solution, pure water, the plant cells absorb that water and become what's called turgid. It's very rigid. They have a lot of pressure. Um, that's what, when a, a plant is wilty, what do you do? You give it water. The water goes into the stem. It uh, makes everything more rigid and gives them much more strength. The flip side is if you were to add um, a hypertonic solution to a plant, salt, salt water. You guys did that in lab, I believe. Add salt water to a plant, the plasma membrane rips away from the cell wall and uh, puts every, all the organelles in one corner. It's lost water. It can't survive. It wilts and dies. That's why uh, if you were to, I don't know, try watering plants with Gatorade, I had a student decide to do that one year because, you know, Gatorade's got electrolytes in it. Um, it. All the plants died across the board because there's too many solutes. Um, the Romans and the Carthaginians, how many of you guys have taken world history or, I guess, Western Civ? All right, do you remember the, the it was the Pyrrhic Wars, wasn't it? Where the Roman, the uh, Roman, Roman Carthage, Carthage is in Africa, Rome is in Italy, they fought each other. The Romans beat the Carthaginians back down to Carthage, and they're like, all right, you stay there. We're going to go back to Italy and chill uh, and take over the rest of the world. And they're like, OK, OK, that's cool. A few decades later, the Carthaginians are like, hey, let's go mess with Rome. So then they went up. They went across the, um, across the Mediterranean, attacked Rome. Romans beat them back to Carthage, and Romans got there and were like, OK, we said stop. Just stop. OK, no, we're not going to do anything. 
Carthaginians then said, okay, we got a new idea, new idea. We're going to go and attack Rome, but this time we're going to go up. We're going to take our elephants with us, because that's a great idea. Take our elephants up through Spain, cross through France, across the Alps, uh, down the Pyrenees Mountains, and hit Rome from behind. And they did that, and a lot of their elephants died. Uh, but they got to Rome, and then the Romans beat them all the way back down to Carthage. And this time they said, okay, you're done. Um, we're going to salt your fields. So what they did was they took salt crystals, laid them out in the fields, and that salt created a hypertonic solution. So now the plants wouldn't grow. And the plants wouldn't just grow for a year, two years, decades and decades. There was famine. The Carthaginians could, uh, did everything they could to survive, and it was really hard for them. Uh, they couldn't make war on Rome anymore. Similarly, my crazy aunt, um, she decided, she's, she's one of those people who's really into conspiracy theories, and decided that she was going to make her own herbicide. So she made it out of salt. And she decided to spray all of her garden with this salt herbicide to kill the weeds. And she was shocked, utterly shocked, that every single vegetable in her garden also died. <laughs> and she's like, I made a super herbicide. And I was like, no, you just, literally, thousands of years we've known this would happen. But the Illuminati, so you know. Um, if you were to put a plant into a salt solution, they are going to die because the water gets removed from the cells. If a plant loses 40% water weight, you cannot recover it. For us, um, if you've been dehydrated, people tell you drink more water. If you go to the hospital and you're dehydrated, they don't hook sterile water up to your arm. What would happen if they put sterile water in your arm? You would scream, ah, they put a needle in me. Why would you die? Why would it be bad? What would happen to your cells? You got pure water going next to these blood cells. They would lice. Every single one of them starts popping like a little balloon. And it's really cool to watch. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do uh, bloodborne. We can't play with human blood in here because of possible disease. But hypothetically, if you were to look at a drop of blood in a drop of water, what you would see literally watching under the um, microscope is pop, 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 little fireworks going off as all of the blood cells um, lysed. Water, rush in. water rushes in, causing them all to pop. I think for Bio 101 students, it's not a good idea to but do like it with. Animal. That would be fine, yeah. It works with animal blood, too. With animal blood too. Yes. What would happen if you put um, a red blood cell into a hypertonic solution? All the water goes out. You need to make an isotonic solution, which is why they give you, when you're dehydrated, saline. Because what saline is, is it um, has the same um, level of solute as your blood cells, as your plasma. Maybe. I haven't, I've never tasted, tasted in the back of my throat when they did that to me. Animal cells need to protect themselves from this osmotic lysing. The way they can do that is with a contractile vacuole. Vacuoles are important not just for storage, um, but they're important for maintaining cell volume. What happens is water floods into the cell and it expands. And then after it expands, it, the uh, cell uses energy to squeeze it shut and push the water out. Contractile vacuole. So that's osmosis. Osmosis is just sort of the natural extension of diffusion. Moving from an area, uh, solutes moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So these are two distinct processes, diffusion and osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water. Diffusion is the movement of solutes. Osmosis, you're moving from, uh, water moves from hypotonic to hypertonic. Diffusion, you're moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And it is passive. It happens without any energy. Here, you've got individual molecules of dye. 
high concentration on the left, low concentration on the right. Over time, they reach equilibrium where they're equally spread apart. So diffusion is the movement of solutes from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Here's an example. OK, before we go, what color is this? Blue. Blue. OK. Whoever I hear first, that's the color we're defining it as. What color is this? Green. 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 What color is that? Red. Red. OK, good. And the reason I have to define those is because I once ended up having a class spend 15 minutes arguing over colors. So these blue ones, which way are they going to move, toward A or B? They're going to move toward B. High concentration here, still expand out over here. How about the um, green ones? They're not going to really go anywhere. They're, sort of, they're already in equilibrium. And the red ones? They're going to move toward A. That's diffusion. There was a lot going on in that one where we took our, uh, our understanding of the membrane itself and the structure of the membrane, applying its form to its particular function. In this mini lecture, we talked about osmosis and diffusion, two types of passive transport. So passive transport does not require energy, and it's moving molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. They naturally move that way due to intermolecular forces. Um, you could think of it as uh, uh, diffusion is the movement of solutes, and uh, osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules. We talked a bit about tonicity. That is, uh, how a cell might be in relation to the surrounding solution that's embedded in. That cell might be isotonic, in which case it has the same molarity or the same solute concentration on the inside of the cell as it does on the outside of the cell. And water moves in two directions. It might be the um, cell may be, or the solution may be hypotonic to the cell. If the solution is hypotonic, that means that there's a lower solute concentration in the solution and a higher solute concentration inside the cell. So water always moves to where the solutes are inside the cell. Uh, and they might be in a hypertonic solution. Hyper means lots and lots of solute in solution, little bit in the cell. So water will move from the cell where there's more solute, I'm sorry, less solute into the solution and shrivel up or crenate, maybe undergo plasmolysis if it's a plant cell. So a lot going on. These have a lot of uh, implications for the future. We're going to see how we can use these gradients that form in order to power cellular reactions. And they come in, they become really important when we talk about cellular metabolism. Here are the content review questions for this mini lecture. They're there to focus your studies. The next lecture, we talked this time about passive transport. The next mini lecture is about active transport, using energy to move solutes across a gradient or against a gradient. I hope you stick around and see it.